chapter 3, section 1. This is one of my favorite chapters. It is about the origins of the universe. The first learning objective is to explain the origins of the universe. I feel pretty strongly about this actually because if you're going to be college educated, then you should have some awareness of the world around you and that includes a greater universe as well. And so many of us go through college and never really understand where we came from. After this lesson, you should be able to see just how we are connected to the cosmos as we understand the origins of the universe, time and biology, and how we understand that based on science. Let me start with a quick question for you. What is the age of the universe? Is it a few thousands of years old? Several millions of years old? Is it ageless, meaning it's always been here? Determining the age of the universe is not possible. Or is it about 13.7 billion years old? If you choose E, you choose correctly. Now that is an interesting point. The universe is 13.7 billion years old. That means it's really old, but it hasn't been around forever. That means it had a beginning. That's a very profound statement. How do we know this? Sometime about 13.7 billion years ago, the universe began in an instant of time with a giant bang. We actually call that the Big Bang Theory. But the question you should be asking is, how do we know the universe began 13.7 billion years ago? Is there any evidence for that? And how did we come across that evidence? The first good evidence for the origins of the universe came out in the 1920s when astronomers were making observations of galaxies. One of those astronomers was named Edwin Hubble. You may have heard of him after the famed Hubble Space Telescope. In the 1920s, astronomers were interested in learning what galaxies were. They didn't know what they were to begin with, but later on they found out they were a large collection of stars. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. You can actually see it from the night sky. It's about 2.2 million light years away. Now, throughout the 1920s, through lots of observations, they began to realize that galaxies were very distant and they were made up of billions of stars like our own. Here's another example of a galaxy. As you can see, there are billions of stars here, and in some cases, some galaxies may have upwards of a trillion different stars. This is an artistic rendition of the Milky Way galaxy. This is our home galaxy. There are an estimated 200 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone, and there are probably that many planets as well, probably more. Now, to give you an example of how big this galaxy is, it would take light 100,000 years to go across this galaxy. And light moves pretty fast. If you were moving at the speed of light, it would be about 186,282 miles per second. That's fast enough to go around the Earth seven times in one second. Now to also give you some example of how big our galaxy is, imagine that our entire solar system from the Sun all the way out to Neptune was the size of a nickel. If that's the size of our own solar system, then our galaxy would be the size of the United States. There's where our Sun is located in our galaxy. You can see one of the armbands of a galaxy on a clear night, and you can see thousands of stars. Now Hubble began to observe that there were lots of galaxies in the universe, and in recent times we have discovered a lot of galaxies. In Hubble's time they realized that galaxies were made up of stars, but Hubble also made another observation. As he looked upon the galaxies and throughout the universe, he realized there were thousands of them. In this photo right here you can see lots and lots of galaxies. About every dot in there is a galaxy with billions of stars. But what Hubble realized is that they were all moving away from us. And how did he know that? The answer to his question is actually fairly straightforward. You see, light travels in waves. The longer the wavelength, the less energy it has. The shorter the wavelength, the more energy it has. As you can see, visible light is but a tiny part of all of the light that's out there. We actually call that the electromagnetic spectrum. Now I'll notice that wavelength is on the right. So longer wavelengths would be reddish, shorter wavelengths would be bluish, or to even violet. That's why ultraviolet light can harm you because the light waves have a lot of energy to them, whereas 
red light and infrared light, they can't hurt you at all. And when he looked across the cosmos, he realized the light were all red coming from these galaxies, and some more so than others. The reason why the light is all shifted to the red is because they're moving away from us. It's called the Doppler effect. You've experienced this standing on the side of a road. If a car is coming at you, it's high pitched. If the car moves away from you, it's lower pitched. Light is the exact same way. If an object is moving away from you, the light waves are elongated. They're spread out. They have a longer wavelength. They appear more reddish. Likewise, if an object is moving at you, the light waves are more compressed and they appear more bluish. There's a logical conclusion to this. If you look out across the cosmos and you see that all these galaxies are moving away from you, that means the universe is expanding. It's getting larger. Now, go back in time. That means the universe is contracting. Go back far enough and it'll contract into something the size of the head of a pen. Pretty amazing that that can happen, but it did. We can look at the galaxy all across the universe and we can get an estimate of the age of the universe based on the distances we see them. And we've estimated the age of the universe to be approximately 13.7 billion years old. The development of the Big Bang Theory really followed the scientific method. It began with Edwin Hubble making observations of galaxies and asking the question as to why they were moving across, away from us. And over time, the Big Bang Theory was developed. And like any good theories, it's well supported, but it also generates additional questions and predictions. Okay, the universe is a finite age. That means we should only be able to see so far away from us because the further away you look, the further back in time you look. We call that a light year. That's a distance light travels in one year. Now, if I tell you something's 2.2 million light years away, that means that light's been traveling for 2.2 million years. So you're seeing that object as it was 2 million years ago. When we look out in the universe, the furthest objects we can see are about 13.1 billion light years away. That means that the light traveling from that galaxy left it over 13 billion years ago, long before our sun came along, and that was when the universe was in its infancy. We could see objects further away because they're plenty bright, but we don't. The reason why we don't see anything beyond 13.1 billion light years away is because there weren't many galaxies there at all. They were just starting to form. If the universe began with a giant cataclysmic explosion, there should be some residual energy. There should be an afterglow to the Big Bang. Well, that was predicted in the 1930s and 40s. It was actually discovered by the 1960s with this very first radio telescope. They built it to discover and study radio waves coming from deep space. Well, whenever they pointed it anywhere in the night sky, they got a humming sound. They would just go bzzz. They found it everywhere. They thought that it, there were bird nests in it. They thought that it wasn't grounded correctly. So they spent all this time trying to fix it. But what they discovered was the afterglow of the Big Bang. They actually went on to win a Nobel Prize for their discovery. You wonder how big the universe is? It's big. It's about 43 billion light years across. But how much is in the galaxy? How much is in the universe? In the 1980s, we knew there were about 100 billion or so galaxies in the universe. Here's the ultra deep field view taken in 2003. In this image, there are over 10,000 galaxies. You can't see them all from this image on your computer because you don't have the resolution. But every dot, every smudge, every smear is a galaxy. Each one with hundreds of billions of stars. That's a lot of biology out there, guys. The Hubble Deep Field View began on September 24th. On March 9th, they finally released some of the most incredible images ever. Sit back and enjoy these views of the universe.
Isn't that about humbling? To think of all those galaxies out there and it would take the Hubble almost a million years to observe the entire sky in the same level of detail. And we're going to have an even more powerful telescope set up in 2018. 13 billion years old. Our galaxy is about that old too. However, the light from some of those galaxies, we are looking at them as they were 13 billion years ago when they were very young. I've been showing the ultra deep field view in class for almost a decade now. And even to this day, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. So it makes me think about my place in the universe. As we move on now, I want to talk about the origins of the elements. Elements are atoms, and atoms are made up of three subatomic particles. Protons that have a positive charge, neutrons that have a neutral charge, and electrons that have a negative charge. These three subatomic particles were created in the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. They are the basic fundamental building blocks of the universe. So think about that. At your most fundamental level, you are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And most of the protons and electrons inside of you are over 13.7 billion years old. They have been there since the beginning of time and space itself. Some of the neutrons in you may have been there as, from the beginning as well. However, neutrons are also created in stellar processes. As you can see, we're connected to the cosmos. Now my next subtitle is, we're connected to the stars. And how exactly are we connected to the stars? Well, before I start talking about our connection to the stars, I want you to realize that there are lots of stars in the universe. And you're probably getting that idea from the number of galaxies. This is an image of our sun, and it's the closest star to us. If you've ever walked on a beach, there's a lot of sand. This is from one of my favorite places in North Florida. There are more stars in the universe than there are sand grains on all the beaches of the world. That's a lot of stars. Now stars are very important to us for several reasons. And not all stars are created the same. Our sun is that small yellow one. Stars can be much smaller and they can last a very long time. And stars can be much larger and they don't last as long at all. In fact, there's our sun next to some of the largest stars we know about. And as you can see, that they are enormous compared to our sun. And that's actually very important directly to us. You see, stars have a process called nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion takes place whenever you take the nuclei of atoms, which would be protons and neutrons. But most atoms are hydrogen. And if you heat them up enough, they overcome the repulsive force and they slam into each other and they fuse together and release enormous amounts of energy. So when you see our sun, the energy coming from the sun is coming from the fusion of hydrogen nuclei into helium. Now, a star is a great big ball of gas of hydrogen and helium and gravity contracts it. Now once it reaches nuclear fusion, it starts putting out enough energy to stop gravity from taking over and keeping it from collapsing indefinitely. Now eventually, a star will run out of hydrogen. At that point, it will shed its outer layers and the core will begin to collapse. And as it does so, it heats back up. And over time, at the end of a star's life, these stars will begin to fuse helium and lithium and beryllium and boron. And then importantly for us, things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sodium, potassium, chlorine. If you notice, all of those elements are found in us. Now finally, large stars, they'll get to something like iron and nickel. Once stars begin to fuse iron and nickel, they no longer release enough energy to prevent the collapse of the star. And when that happens, something big happens. They go boom. And cataclysmic explosions. Not as big as the Big Bang, but these explosions are enormous. And one occurred about five billion years ago that sparked the genesis of our own solar system and it created all of the elements on earth that we have in us. So we have hydrogen that was created during the Big Bang, but all of the carbon in you, all of the nitrogen in you, the oxygen that we breathe, and the calcium, potassium, all of that was created in the star. 
and when it exploded, it spread it throughout the earth. I mean, throughout the galaxy. Then the explosion was so big and so powerful that it also created things like lead, mercury, gold, and silver. This is the Crab Nebula. This is from an explosion that went off about a thousand years ago. And you can see that it's quite colorful and it's spreading all these different elements throughout the galaxy that we've picked up by another second or third generation star, much like ourselves. So we are stardust. We are the remnants of an exploded star from five billion years ago. Now to clarify, the subatomic particles inside of you are 13.7 billion years old, but the elements of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, they're only about five billion years ago created inside of a supernova explosion and inside of a star before it exploded. So before the Big Bang, these are basically all the elements in the universe. Hydrogen is at number one on your top left, and that represents 75% of the visible universe. Helium is about 24%. After the supernova explosions and through stellar processes, all these other elements are created by stars. So there's another connection for us to the universe. Not only do we rely on the Big Bang to give us all the energy and matter that we're going to ever have, but it was stellar processes, things that take place inside of stars, fusion, that created all these elements that made life possible. And of course, it also made heavy metal possible, like Iron Maiden, Metallica, Spinal Tap, and don't ever forget Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath, although they were pretty good with Ronnie James Dio too. So what does it mean? You're stardust, literally. So if you're wearing a gold necklace, just think, that gold is the dust of a star that exploded about five billion years ago.